Jeff McLean. He is with Rocky Mountain School of Photography, and uh, he's going to talk about taking pictures of your food and uh, give you some real nice tricks of how to make your food look fabulous. Yeah, there's a lot to it. Uh, well, I'm going to try to keep it simple as we get. I mean, food photography itself is a whole specialty, and I don't know where everybody's at as far as photography in general. Um, you know, if you have a digital SLR, you take pictures with your iPhone, or you have an even better camera, or anything like that, because um, you can get into lighting. But I'm really going to kind of try to focus on how we can take it and keep it really simple. Because some of the best food photography in the world right now, particularly with the trend being of you know, how people photograph food, is all done by natural light. At a window, the um, person who shoots most of their I say, McDonald's work, which is in the food photography world, I mean, obviously it's not the greatest of food out there, but it's some of the biggest accounts you can get in food photography, is those kinds of people. That's all shot by natural light. Well, you know, like, no equipment besides the camera and some foam core and whatnot. Um, so, my name is Jeff McLean. Um, I worked for about 10 years in San Francisco in commercial photography, and I continue to work for various clients. I just flew back in a couple nights ago from uh, Texas. I was there for like six weeks, uh, working with Pier One Imports, and uh, which is not food, but a lot of product photography and. I used to shoot for William Sonoma, Cook's catalog, and I shot for Duke Coffee, and uh, Robert McDonald's wine, and a number of wineries in the back of the valley. So a lot of food, a lot of wine, things like that. Food photography. So we've seen these kind of shots um, that are just awful. And we're going to kind of look into like, well, why? And you know, what makes them awful? And for whatever weird reason, I don't know what it is with like Chinese restaurants, but typically their photography is awful. Mm -hmm. And they'll print it on the worst paper possible, stick it in a laminate plastic thing, and then stick it on the window of their, their restaurant. And I'm just like, I don't know how to help you. And I, you know, I don't know what the, what the deal is, but it seems to be this like common thing. Um, for example, this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, just harsh lighting, typically just the plated and then it's shot under the existing incandescent lights. The lighting's coming from straight down, usually in the kitchen uh, or, you know, in the dining room. And it just does not make for very nice lighting of the shots. We'll talk about that. So let's look at some more awful photography and then we'll get into the good stuff. So it's literally just been thrown down. So the best food photography in the world, which this is not, uh, is carefully sculpted on the plate. There's typically, uh, when you, with the higher end clients, you have a whole other person, the food stylist. And their job is to not only know how to cook everything, the difference between a julienne and a, and a shoot, I don't really know, some of the different terms for the way you chop things. Um, they need to know how, what braising is, poaching, all the different ways you can cook different items out there. But more importantly than that, they need to know how it's going to look under the scrutiny of a lens. Which is kind of a whole different deal. I've worked with a lot of chefs who are like kind of rocket stylists. They're really, really good at chefs and cooks are really good at making it look great on the plate as you go to eat it. But how a lens sees things is completely different. And the resolution of some of these cameras today, all of a sudden, your point of view and where the lighting's coming from, they have to know a lot of different things about presenting food to a camera. And often they work with a food stylist assistant whose job is to do the cooking. I've worked with this one duo, and the assistant has no interest in becoming a food stylist because she knows that when she gets into styling, she'll be mostly sculpting, and she really enjoys cooking. So she's like totally happy to like be the food stylist assistant cook all day long. Um, interesting stuff. But they're a specialty on their own, not something you would find in Missoula, Montana, food stylists. So it's up to you uh, to kind of look into it. There's some really good books out there. There's one all about food styling, and it's really thick. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. It's like a $50 book. And, uh, you know, these are kind of some of the things we don't want to be doing with our food. Burgers, in particular, they're very tricky to photograph and make look good. Oh, what is going on here? White plate, 
bright things attract our eyes. So we're looking at this white plate and then just this pile of mush. Not so great. Here's a scenario of, again, another kind of white plate. This was actually taken off of um, a restaurant here in town. And, uh, and surprisingly, a very a, a high-end restaurant for Missoula. And I was kind of shocked. I was like, this is just a garbage photo, especially because we got some weird digital truncation at the top of the image. It's photographed under incandescent lighting. And incandescent lighting um, tends to photograph orange. But you'll kind of see it tungsten lighting as an orange light source. And so it renders with this like awful orange. So why is this here? I should call them. Um, or quickly snap as it's sitting under, you know, sitting, waiting for the server to take it out to the dining room. Uh, oh, get a shot of that. Uh, not really the best time. If you're going to get shots of your food, you kind of have to be willing to burn a little food. Not literally, but I mean, like, you need to be willing to waste some food. And spend a day shooting your product in its best scenario. Not like the moment that it's heading out to, to be served, but Take a day to be like, I'm going to do a whole line of photography of my stuff, and I'm not going to worry. Maybe I'll invite some people over to eat it when I'm done taking pictures of it. But you kind of got to be willing to waste some of that. You'd be blown away at the amount of waste that goes on in real food photography. You're going to do a turkey shoot, we'll get like 10 turkeys. Got to get that perfect turkey. And it's not fully cooked, because we don't have four hours to spend cooking a turkey for it to come out and not look right. We use the raw turkey, and we use a hand torch and we torch the outside of the turkey. It's all raw turkey, so we have some turkeys and magazines and stuff. Just don't have you know, the time to cook turkeys. Another scenario, like, well, what's the subject? You know, we've got this cake, we've got these green beans, they're all kind of lined up here with this whatever that is in the back. We're not really sure. This is probably the what we call in the industry hero item. This right here is what is really being sold off the menu, so that should really be front and center, and that's what you know, would be the focus of the shot. Um, again, more shots taken from a restaurant here in town. I'm just like, wow, unbelievable. Liquids like beer, um, beer and wine and, and other liquids that have color uh, need to be backlit in order to get the color to show up. Um, most liquids out there need to be backlit. So the light coming from behind. So here are some key factors to think about, and we'll go through some of them, the presentation of the food itself. Not to your eye as you're going to eat it or how you would serve it to somebody, but thinking really pinpoint microscopic, like what angle of this plate or item do I really want to be looking at? What is the, the hero element of what I'm presenting? Whatever that food item may be that you the composition of the shot, that goes, you know, sort of ubiquitous among all photography, but it falls into food photography as well. We'll talk about proper composition, just some tips about you know, what you can think about. Proper exposure, so making sure you have highlights that aren't completely blowing out or really dark areas, trying to keep your contrast looking good, not too contrasty and not too flat. Uh, something that has kind of some snap to it, and uh, that will also help bring about and then light quality is probably one of the biggest ones and it's one of the easiest ones. That shelf right there, that window faces north, I'm guessing. This feels like north to me. That north facing windows are your best friend when shooting food. So if you can find a north facing window, and the reason why is we don't want direct sunlight going over the top of the food because that will create a lot of contrast. And you think about it, if you're outside on a sunny day and there's no clouds in the sky, the sun is 10 million miles away, and it's a small light source. And small light sources create hard, harsh shadows. So if you're out on a sunny day, no clouds in the sky, and you look around, you'll notice hard shadows everywhere falling off of everything. And so if you set your food item in harsh sunlight, you're going to get hard shadows showing up. On a cloudy day, however, it's all soft shadows, which is much more pleasing for portraits, products, people, Cars, that's where they shoot cars out of dawn or dusk. Um, so, and same with food. And until you really, you know, can start working with light, and you, in some cases, pro food photographers can work with both hard light and soft light to kind of bring about the glisten and the crispiness of certain things using different light sources. But 
for those who don't necessarily want to be spending all their time doing photography, but actually be running your business, but you know, like limited time, limited resources, you don't have to buy a ton of equipment, north facing windows are your best friend for getting that open sky, it's nice and soft, so even on a bright sunny day, you're using this open sky that isn't bright sun, that's why. And then propping and surfaces, thinking about hmm, how can I jazz up my shot with some little things in the background, little splashes of color, maybe a colored napkin, you know, trying to mix it up a little bit so it's not just white plate, food on the white plate, or uh, whatever you're doing. Freshest ingredients that you can possibly use. Really, the timing of this is important. You don't want your food to be sitting around for too long. Um, what we'll do in the professional photography world is we have a stand-in plate. So if you have a plated dish that you're looking to photograph um, or a food product, you would get your lighting and your composition set with a stand-in. Say you have, you know, even if it's say, like a jar of honey and you have a couple of them, you would first get that set to go. You would have a number of them. You'd look carefully at all of those different jars if it's a package product. And you would find the one that has the label that is on perfect. Some of them might have a label that's a little askew. If you're not looking at that carefully, you might inadvertently quickly photograph the wrong one, and then you've got a Photoshop challenge on your hands to try to fix that problem. So you want to get a bunch of your items together and look at them carefully, find the hero, the one that you want to use, set it aside, get your composition set, get your lighting looking right, and then what I use are like little mini A clamps. I call them A clamps, construction clamps. These guys, shaped like A's. Use like little ones, and you can block off your product like that. Pull out this one, put in the hero, like so, pull the A clamp out, and then take a shot. And if you're dealing with plates, same thing, you would get your stand in food, biscuits and gravy, whatever. You know, you get some biscuits and gravy, that's what you're going to shoot. I don't know if you guys are going to be shooting, but you know, you have a stand in, and it can just be mush, it can be whatever. It can be like kind of similar to what you're going to like create. And then get your lighting and composition right, feeling good, block it off with an A clamp, pull that plate out. Meanwhile, after you've gotten your lighting and composition looking good, oh, thank you. Composition looking good, you know, you're sculpting that off to the side in the kitchen, like getting the biscuits in there, best looking biscuits of all the biscuits you've cooked, and then you're gonna carefully get some gravy going over the top in a pleasing way, and then you pull these out, put the hero in, take the shot. The lighting's all set, composition set for you. <coughs> so, you also want to think about in the way that you want to be looking at the food. As you're crafting that plate with the intention of photographing it, you're going to have a side that you want to be looking at. So you want to be thinking about, as you're, as you're crafting that perfect dish, what side of the plate you want to be looking at. Here's the hero spot, so that when you lay it in there, that's the side that the camera's looking at. And we'll talk about the rule of thirds, which is a common compositional sort of thing to think about in photography. And you can craft your plate around that. As far as composition, you may consider some of these things. Um, choosing a format and sticking to it. If you're designing a website, maybe you want to think about, well, I want all my photos to be vertical portrait orientation. I want all my photos to be horizontal orientation. Or I want all my photos to be square. It can be kind of nice, too. Uh, if you're working with Instagram, Instagram grid already crops your images as a square. Uh, and now they're letting you use 4 by 5 aspect ratio or, or 16 9, which is sort of like movie aspect ratio. Um, but it, in the grid, it'll still show you squares. So you, know, you don't have a whole lot of control over that. But it's something to think about. And you know, something you could disagree with too. You could say, ah, I'm going to do horizontal and vertical. I don't care. Uh, but it's something to think about if you're building a website and having a nice consistent flow of your images as people are going. Rule of thirds, we'll talk about that. Horizons, trying to avoid from tabletop, the back edge of tabletop horizons, from being dead center through the shot. Try to get them lower or higher, or not at all. But going dead center, usually compositionally in photographs, we don't want our horizons to go right through the middle of the scene. We want them to be in either the lower third or the upper third of the shot. Um, and then 
again, things to think about, you know, getting in there with a real tight lens, you want to avoid wide angle lenses. You really want to use a normal lens, which would be like a 15 millimeter lens or longer, preferably. If you, don't, if you happen to have a macro lens, that's great. If you're using an iPhone, that's fine. Um, but really, getting in low and looking at the food, as opposed to, typically, most people want to take photos from their standing position. All their shots are like at this angle. But it's more interesting when you look at things from lower angles. Or, even better, you take that plated food and you put it down on the floor and you shoot straight down on it. It's another very common look that we're seeing in food photography. And it's a great, super graphic way to present your food, too, because you get the round plate or maybe a square plate, cups and glasses, different things like that, depending on what you guys have to shoot. So rule of thirds, this is what we're talking about. You're imagining this grid where either things are split into vertical thirds, into columns, or horizontal, rather rows across thirds, and it's those intersections. These are the points where you would want to try to land the hero part of your shot, is in one of these points, these intersections here. Shows up in you know photography all over. You know, internet, you'll start to see the rule of thirds show up a lot in composition, and that it's a very strong way to compose your photographs. For example, you could just put your item dead center in the shot, or you could put it down and let lets the eye kind of move around the shot a lot more. It creates a stronger photograph. Here's another example. Rule of thirds. You can see where the intersection, the main part of the shot is landing up in that upper left hand quadrant. If that was, if this shot had that dead center, eh, it's not nearly as interesting, but it allows, makes our eye kind of move around the shot. So this is the grid that you would keep in mind when you're visualizing and looking at the image on your iPhone or your digital camera, whatever you're using. So we'll look at some you know, better photography. Um, this is from a uh, area restaurant in town as well. So we've got some of the things that we're looking at. We're looking at a certain amount of rule of thirds happening, uh, nice backlit lighting, and uh, we can see that because we've got these hot highlights that are sort of on the back edge of these lines. The light is coming generally from behind in this scenario. And most food is really likes to be photographed from with the lighting coming from behind, backlit. You don't really want to front light your food. It's just not going to look all that great. You're not going to be able to get that good glisten out of it. And that's what kind of like makes people salivate when they see that, you know, that glisten. Scenarios like this, where you have, you know, so breaking the rules in this scenario, you got a center com composition, but then you've got these other areas of interest, but utilizing a very shallow depth of field. So I'm not sure where we you know, photographically your knowledge, but using apertures on your camera that are very wide open. Um, and so I think even with some of the uh, apps today and iPhones, you can even emulate some of that, which is kind of nice. Which basically what that means is this part's nice and sharp, a little bit of sharpness here, but everything else falls in a soft focus. It's a very common trick in food photography. Some straight down shots, looking straight down at uh, the items and we've got light that's kind of raking in from one angle, generally from behind, and uh, you know, interesting surfaces, whatever you can kind of get your hands on to mix it up. And I'll talk about how you can make some surfaces too. So here's a scenario where we have, you know, our general focus of this shot, sort of the hero area, and then soft focus heading back, well, you know, wide open, and nice backlighting. You can see the backlighting because you can kind of see the window. This is just shot in the restaurant by a window. Rule of thirds. So you can see generally the focal point of this shot is landing in that, that zone. So quality of your light. Use window light. Keep it simple. Um, you know, you don't have to go burn a bunch of money on strobe equipment um, unless you really know how to use it. Window light is perfect for keeping things inexpensive. Preferably on the north side of the building, 
So only the soft disk is lighting and that's what we're looking for. If the window does have bright sun, say you have a building that doesn't have any window on the north side and you're gonna get some sun and you need to photograph, you can make a really inexpensive diffusion panel, which you put in front of the window and it just softens that light. And you go down to the university bookstore into the sort of art zone and they have these canvas stretcher bars that our students you know, stretch canvas on for their painting. And they're pretty inexpensive, like a you know, couple bucks per section. And you could get, you know, I guess you could get like four that are about two foot, two foot or three foot, three foot, depending on the size of your window. You know, get like a three foot by four foot shape. So two three foot bars and two four foot bars that dovetail together, so you have like a frame. And then you go down to Ace Hardware and you pick up some shower curtain liner, sort of translucent, you know, $5 shower curtain liner. And you staple gun it and you pull it taut to that frame and then you tape it down with some duct tape on all the edges and poof, you got this like big diffusion panel for under 10 bucks. You could buy that on Amazon and spend 150 bucks for the one that says photo on it or you could that'll diffuse all that hard, harsh sun and make it nice and soft. So, if you're in a scenario where you don't have north-facing windows and you just have bright sun to deal with, you can diffuse it with the patented jet plane art canvas <laughs> diffusion panel. Um, so, we're looking to you know, avoid the, this harsh sun because it creates harsh shadows. And you know, you can deal with certain one of your other best friends would be to go down to Michael's and just pick up a piece of foam core. Some piece of foam core, you could even get a sheet and then like this one, cut it down. And then you have two pieces. And, you know, depending on how the size of the stuff that you're photographing, you may not need a piece that's any bigger than this. And then you, while you're at Ace Harbor getting diffusion materials, you can pick up an eggplant and set it like that. And it's great because now you have your backlit food, you've got a fill card to fill in some of those shadows that might, might still have some dark areas. And then you can use this fill card and set it in there. And it'll help to lighten up some of those dark areas of your product. Food, product, whatever it is you guys have going on. Looking to backlight the food, uh, I tend to go from 140 degrees, we'll talk about that, uh, from the camera. Or I'll side light it, I'll photograph it so that the lighting is coming in just from one side. But I'll almost always avoid front lighting my, any of my products, food. I mean, you can check out my website, it's almost all back with it. Um, at McLean Photo, M C L A I N Photo.com. Um, so, I will get some good food photography. So, you know, utilizing interesting props that you might find at thrift stores, more interesting surfaces, hunks of wood, interesting weird rusty metals that have patinas on them. I make a lot of surfaces in my backyard. Um, and then, you know, photographing again, we got light that's kind of coming in from behind in this shot. And we can tell that because some of the shadows are falling forward towards the camera. So it's backlit. So 140 degrees would be, if your camera is here, looking at the shot, opposite of it would be 180 degrees on the compass dial. So having your light generally coming from 140 degrees, raking kind of towards the camera, you can see how these shadows generally fall in that direction. So that's a really good position to kind of think about when you're photographing your food. So yeah, home resource, we've probably all been there. Scrap lumber, lumber counter surfaces, weird stuff. I'm always going there and checking it out, um, seeing what they have. You can make your own. You can water down some colored paint to paint on wood to kind of give it a weathered look. So you get a little bit of paint, a bunch of water, and just paint it on some wood, and it gives it this sort of weathered look, which is nice. That's good for some of the real already weathered, funky wood that you might find at home. Tiles, they have a whole lot of different tiles. Tiles can be really nice as well. They have a bunch of big one foot tiles and then you know, there's on the surface. Rusty, funky metals, interesting patinas. Or I'll get four by four sheets of uh, you know, plywood or lighter weight 
materials at Home Depot, and uh, sometimes I'll, I'll go there and get it four by eight sheet, and I'll have them cut it down to four by fours. And then I'll go to, I'll be you know, over there at Michael's, and I'll get some of these artist mediums, like gesso, it's like these white containers. And it's basically just this looks like sour cream, and spread it, and I'll use knives, and I'll make cuts and stuff into these panels, and I'll put this gesso on it, and then I'll let that dry. It gets like this crusty kind of thing. And then I'll come in with another knife, and I'll make some more texture to it, texture with weird brushes, and, and then I'll maybe paint it with different layers of paint. I'll take paint rollers, and I'll get some paint on it, and I'll hit it, but I'll hit it kind of lightly so that it's not like a real opaque amount of paint on the board, but just kind of lightly hits it and gives it this like, weird textures. And those can be really nice as well for photographing things. So, you know, we're just rule of thirds. We've got light coming in from 140 degrees generally. We've got, we're going straight down on this product. And uh, it's much more pleasing than if this was centered and if the light was coming from the ceiling from a light. Thirds coming into play there. Another scenario where we've got light coming in from 140 degrees, interesting props, interesting surface, and uh, you know, real fresh looking food. So, to review, use the freshest ingredients possible. Shoot at the moment of construction, get a stand in plate going. Really think about what side of this item do I want to be looking at? What's kind of the hero angle on this? And then get an A-clamp or something to block it off. Sometimes I'll use like these little acrylic blocks or I'll use um, dice to block off my plate. One here, one here, and that tells me where my plate's at. So I don't have to, you know, that's shooting almost everything on tripod. I try to. So if you don't have one, you can certainly, you know, wing it with an iPhone. So using a stand-in plate, get that composition and lighting set, and then drop the hero food in there, take the shot. Use north-facing windows when possible, uh, or use a diffusion panel. You know them, bookstore, shower curtain liner, makes hardware, and uh, an A-clamp. Use the rule thirds in your compositions. That's a really good way to just improve all photography right off the bat. Shoot directly at the food, as opposed to like the typical where you would see it from my, your eye, because it just seems like that's what everybody's doing. Um, whereas it usually looks better coming down at a lower angle or looking straight down on it. it. Tends to be a little snapshot when it's just coming from like you know the, the five foot eight human perspective. Uh, light from behind or 140 degrees from camera. That'll improve things right off the bat. If it's starting to look a little shadowy in the front, ooh, got a fill card in there. Just fill in some of those shadows. And then use interesting surfaces and props and you know, kind of go to thrift stores and think, oh, that's an interesting glass. Sometimes it's nice to just like in the background of the shop have a couple of colors back there, pour a little colored liquid in them so they're out of focus and just kind of back there hanging out, adding a little. Um, so I always think about in my photography when I'm creating, I do a lot of studio work uh, at RMSP. I'm the um, commercial instructor. So I teach the lighting and tabletop product photography. And most of the students there are like, oh my God, this is the most boring thing ever. Until they start getting into it and they realize that like, they're literally making photographs. Like out there in the world, you're taking them. You're like, snap, snap, snap. What you see, it's already there out in front of you. In the studio world, it's like, here's a blank tabletop, what are you going to do with it? And it's sort of like, it can be a little daunting for some students because all of a sudden they're like, oh, I have to like create it in my mind and then make it here. And to me, that's awesome. I love doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, does any, you guys have any questions about any of this? Anything seem pretty straightforward? Good tips on improving some of your, your stuff. I don't know what you guys have going on. But. What what would you what would we expect to pay for a professional session? Let's say we have a product um, that we want to photograph for a website brand. 
You know, I mean, I think in Missoula, truth be told, I don't do a whole lot of this in Missoula. Um, the reason why is that, uh, I mean, I do when it comes up, but most people in this market um, are happy with mediocre for free rather than to pay for something that's like, wow, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, in a town where you have a photography school, it's just like, oh, we'll just call them and get some students to shoot it. Um, whether that'll be great or not, most people are satisfied. Some things are very difficult to photograph. Cheeseburger, for example, steak, for example. You know, if you don't know how to do it, it can be, it can look awful. <laughs> so if we went into like um, magazine quality, magazine quality. I mean, you know, I think I think in the you know two to five hundred dollar range in Missoula would be a fine sort of day rate. Um, you know, when I do when I do some jobs here, people say, oh, what, what's your per piece rate? And I don't do that because if it takes me, you know, a couple hours to set up a shot, and they only have one thing for me to photograph, like it's hard for me to fill the rest of my day. I would rather say, give me a whole day's worth of work. It would be better for you to give me. Let's let's build out your whole website with imagery, and it all be consistent and all be amazing, rather than like one shot here and one shot there, because then it's hard for me to take. It's like when people call my wife and I do um, video production. Our ceremony is going to be 30 minutes. Can you just shoot the ceremony? If I said I say yes to you shooting just your ceremony, and somebody calls me to shoot the whole day, I've said yes to your ceremony. I'm now not available for the more lucrative whole day. So it's in my client's best interest to come up with like let's let's do like a whole body of work in a whole day because it's going to be better for you financially. You'll get more for the money um, than to go in and just like spend. But in some cases, you might only have one thing. You might be like, well, I've got my jar of clay. I want to photograph that. And that's kind of a different deal. Like, all right, well, then, you know, geez, you know, 100 bucks. Kind of deal. I mean, Missoula is the kind of, kind of place where it's like, um, again, mediocre for free. And just, man, with the ubiquity of digital cameras, uh, there's a line in which people are willing to spend money. And, um, and it just depends on the, the item. You know, I'm shooting some jewelry right now. She has not been able to find somebody who can photograph her jewelry. It's super challenging glass and metal together, which are like both really challenging. And I'm like, I'm your guy, because I've done that before. Um, and it's just, you know, some different specialties. But again, she was like, oh, give her per piece, piece rate. And I'm like, well, that's not really the best use of my time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it would be better, better to, you know, especially it's easier in some scenarios with certain food. If a, it's like a production environment and that similar to food I'm sure when you kind of like get one set up and then you can pump out a whole bunch of product. Um, similar with, with food photography. If you get like one lighting scenario set up and you got a lot of similar items you can kind of keep that set up and then you can produce a whole bunch of photographs out of that scene. But if you're like doing this and then oh, shoot one thing and then the next day somebody got you setting up something else and then you got to turn around and go back and set up your, your scene again. It's a lot of wasted time. So yeah, and the other thing with, you know, di digital imagery that's important I think for you to consider is that um, in dealing with digital files, you want to make sure to name them appropriately. If it comes out of the camera image 9041, uh, not only for your own organization, but for your SEO, for your search engine optimization. And the reason why is a lot of websites today, Google in particular is getting very particular about this. Um, they want a lot of organic hits, is what they call it. They don't want, there used to be these games that web designers uh, would play where you're, they'd have keywords, your top 10 keywords that you want people to find your site. And they would have, say, a background on their website. That's white. That's the background of the site name info. And they would play these games where they would put the keywords embedded into that background in the same white, yeah. so that the text is there on the indexed into the into the website for the keywords. And Google caught onto that, like nope. And that's why you have to do things like blogging and do what's called. Exposure.
external linking, like you work with other vendors and you try to convince them to blog about working with you and a hot hyperlink your website onto their site. And that you will do that in exchange to do that for them. So I was working with so and so, blah, 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 hyperlink website. And they do that too. And that way, if somebody's looking at their website and clicks on your website, Google sees that as an organic hit on your site and it brings your, your SEO up and down the rankings. But also, it's important that somebody types in, say, you know, Zuma Pizza. And at the very top of that line of search, you might get a few images. Show up. Sometimes you'll search for things and images will show up right off the top. And if you have named your file appropriately, Mozilla dash pizza dash, you know, the name of your business, the chances of that showing up over time are much higher right at the top as the imagery, as well as linking it to your website. So it's important to think about not only for organization of your images, but for later when you dump all of those to a website, making sure your main keywords are actually in the name of the file itself. And that'll help get you better Google rankings. So. But yeah, that's, uh, that's you know, the gist of my presentation. How did I do on time? Not too bad, not too bad. Oh, very good. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, if you have questions, you can talk to them. This is um, something that you can also consider using if you don't have excellent light. The directions for making this are on the Moonlight Kitchen uh, website. And you just put your light on the outside and you set your products in here. And it actually takes, gives you some nice this soft light. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So any questions or anything else? Good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I hope that was helpful. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. that'll help you photograph whatever it is you guys are doing. <laughs> uh, Jeff, do you have business cards with you? That you know, I am horrible about that, and I and I, <laughs> it occurred to me. You know, I came here. I just recently RMSP hired me on full time. So oh, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna rep <laughs> RMSP while I'm here. Uh, but, I mean, if you guys are interested in looking at my work, mcleanphoto.com is my website. Um, my, our, my, yeah, Chris knows that one. Um, or my wife and I have a video production company called Camera Room Group Productions. Um, we do weddings, but we also do commercials and all that. And uh, she's a web developer, so that's why I know about some of this web stuff. Good. Thank you all. All right, we'll see you next week. Right. Yeah, good luck to you guys and whatever you're interested in. All right. All right. Yeah, Thank, you Thank you so much. Yeah, that was great. Right. Very yes. good. I think people got a lot out of that. Good. All right. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Yeah.